Very few things on an internet forum will light everything up and bring up more opinions from more people than this. Usually we talk about boats or boat manufacturers here on everything you need to know, but I've been asked way too many questions from way too many boaters to answer these few sort of simple things and I promise I will not, or I'll try not, to let this video turn into a rant. Today on Everything You Need to Know, we are of course talking about engine oil. Marine engine oil. Everything You Need to Know is brought to you by patrons, people who give a couple of bucks per episode to help keep this channel improving. And thank you to the latest patron, Tim. Welcome to the family. Nothing riles up a, let's say, cruisers forum where we've all been and we all have memberships, I'm sure, like the question of what kind of engine oil should I use or how often should I change my engine oil or can I use synthetic? Do I have to use the manufacturer's brand? Today we're going to dive into the ins and outs of oil on boats. Oil is such an interesting subject and it's interesting because the questions don't come from a lack of understanding or a lack of experience on the subject, but more from a complete misunderstanding a lot of people have and how many people claim to be experts on the internet on the subject, but it really isn't all that complicated if you take the time to actually dive into it and learn about it. We usually talk about the history of a boat manufacturer or boat brand before we dive into it. And oil, I think, should be no different. We should actually cover the history. And it's only one paragraph, so it's kind of worth covering. And it's also kind of funny. So in 1866, an American named John Ellis was studying oil, but not for the reasons that you think. He was studying oil as a medicinal healing product, the medicinal properties of oil on the human body, which seems weird. I guess it would moisturize your skin or something. But uh, when he, of course, didn't find any medicinal healing properties in oil, he did figure out through his experimentation that oil had an extremely good lubricating property, particularly on metal parts. And of course, at the time, 1866, steam engines were all the rave. Um, so he sort of shifted his focus from human body medicinal purposes to lubricating steam engines, which is a pretty big change for the company that he had founded to do this thing, which is pretty cool. So steam engines used a mix of petroleum products and animal and vegetable fats at the time. John Ellis, who we're talking about, figured out a way to make oil petroleum oil outperform or perform at higher temperatures and better protect the steam engines from wear and from gumming up their valves and all their moving parts. And that's basically where modern engine oil was born. So oil as we know it in its most rudimentary sense is a petroleum product, dead dinosaurs and et cetera, et cetera, but with additives. And that's important to understand. We're gonna talk a lot about additives because all of the oils have additives. These additives are what really define oil and what you find on the shelf at your auto parts store or marine store or whatever it is. That's what you find on the shelf today is basically all the same thing with different additives. Some additives change the viscosity or the thickness of the oil and it's based on temperature largely. Some provide anti-wear. These additives stop metal parts from corroding and, and rubbing up against each other and things like that. Some uh, additives are detergents and dispersants to battle against sludge in the engine. Um, some, of course, fight corrosion and rust because obviously an engine is metal, so you want to protect it from rust. In an engine, metal parts move around, as we know, very quickly and often at very high temperatures. So the oil's job is to lubricate and prevent wear as the metal parts move around and neutralize sort of the byproducts of combustion. They have to remove sludge from the oil, which cheap oils do make sludge. They have to improve the seals, the rubber gaskets and different things like that. 
And in many cases, the oil also has to cool the engine. If you've ever owned a, a truck with a towing package, it probably has an oil cooler, which is like a tiny radiator mounted to the front of the main radiator. And the oil comes out of the engine, goes through the oil cooling radiator, and then back to the engine to take the heat out of the combustion area, put it through the radiator, cool the oil down, and get rid of that heat. So it's a good thing. I said earlier that there's a lot of misconceptions about oil, and one of the biggest ones is the W on the bottle, on the cord, or whatever it is. It doesn't stand for weight, and a lot of people think it does, and this is because of one of the main measurements of oil is viscosity, which is often referred to as weight. Basically, viscosity is a measurement of how thick the oil is. Think of syrup or marmalade or something like that. Some engines need a thick oil to help seal the engine while it's running, while others need a very thin oil to help the oil circulate because the engine has tighter tolerances and doesn't need the thickness. On that note, you might have a tractor or an old engine that simply needs sort of a 30 weight oil. A 30 weight oil has the viscosity of 30. The viscosity or weight number means it's thicker the higher the number is. So a 20 weight is thinner than a 30 weight. Modern oils have an additive, and we talked a lot about additives, they all have additives, that makes the oil thinner when it's cold and thicker when it's hot. And we see this on modern oils, right on the oil jug, and it's represented by two numbers. So let's examine one oil, the age old 10W30. We've all had an old car from the 80s that required 10W30. The 10 is the viscosity or thickness when the oil is cold. When the car's been sitting all night and you go to start it in the morning, the oil is a 10, which is quite thin. And no, the next letter, W, does not stand for weight. It stands for winter. 10W30 has a viscosity of 10, or fairly thin, which is what 10 is, in the winter or in the cold, even if there's no winter where you live. When the engine is cold, it's a 10. And the actual additives allow the oil to know once it's warmed up to change from a 10 to a 30, which is much, much thicker. So the second number on the bottle is the warm temperature. So you have cold or winter, then the W to signify cold or winter, and then the second number is once the engine's at operating temperature, it gets thinner typically. Now, having said 10W30, we don't see 10W30 much anymore, and there's a good reason for that. Modern engines have much tighter tolerances between the metal surfaces, so the thick oil wouldn't be able to get in there. We need a thinner oil. And the most common thing you'll find today is probably a 5W20. So in the winter, 5W, it's a 5 thickness, much thinner than 10W30. And then once it warms up to our operating temperature, it gets thicker, but not 30 thick, it gets 20 thick. So it's like quite a bit thinner. But the engines have, the tolerances have come much more into play and we've gotten better at making engines. So we need a thinner oil to be able to get in between the metal surfaces, which sort of makes a lot of sense. And these additives sort of help all that happen. You need additives in the oil for all that kind of witchcraft to take place. Now enter diesels. Diesels tend to want a fairly thick oil. So what most of us usually use in a diesel is 15W40. It's a lot thicker than in what you would put in your car, but still able to change its viscosity or its thickness when it gets hot. It goes from 15 to 40. It's nice and thin and easy at the beginning when it's cold for the oil pump to pick it up and circulate around the engine to protect everything. And then it thickens up when the engine gets up to operating temperature and the engine tends to have looser tolerances everything gets further apart because metal expands when it's hot. You need a thicker oil when the engine is up to heat. And we're gonna get back to additives. Diesel oils versus gasoline oils have different additives. And that's because diesels have different byproducts during combustion. Diesels tend to create a lot more soot, for example. So their oils need more detergents. And these are additives that are put into diesel oil more detergent. You often hear that diesel oils are more heavy duty, and it all comes down to additives. One big question I hear quite a lot is, can I run a diesel oil in my car? The answer is sure, yes. They have enough in common with gasoline engine oils that it will work. 
to an extent. However, your car was designed to have certain additives in the oil to counter its byproducts from gasoline combustion that you actually might be causing more harm than good by running a diesel oil in your gasoline car. Now, I do know guys with 800 horsepower LS engines that are built to the nines and they're in their cars and they do use like a 1540 diesel oil for some pretty good reasons. But if you have a car with a stock engine, you're probably doing more harm than good. You should use what the car's manufacturer tells you to use. Okay, so if we separate gasoline engines from diesel engines, people often ask, what weight do I use? Or more accurately, what viscosity, as we discuss the thickness of the oil? And the simple answer is, whatever the manufacturer says to use, the internet is awash with people telling you, change the viscosity based on variables like climate and engine hours and all that kind of stuff, wear and tear. But ultimately, the people who design the engine need to have the final word. Does the oil guru on the internet or on Cruisers Forum or on a post or on Facebook know all of the tolerances of your engine? Things as small as thousandths of an inch in valve lash. No, they don't. Does the Anmar know? Yeah, they do. They built the thing. They designed the thing. And if they say to use 15W40, use 15W40. So I think now we're just gonna jump into the oil myths because I think it's the fastest way to spread information and to sort of get everything out there. So let's just go to myths. Myth number one, can I use synthetic oil in my older engine or my newer engine or my boat's engine or my outboard? The answer in every single, every single case is yes. Always yes, 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 except in one instance. And that is if you live in the 1970s. Let me explain. The myths about synthetic oil being bad in any way come from when synthetic oil first became popular. Some synthetic oils at the time would eat rubber. Seals, gaskets, O-rings, things like that. They would become deformed and no longer seal what they were intended to seal because of synthetic oil back then. However, this has not been a problem in decades. So if the manufacturer says you can use synthetic oil, you can. Next myth, is synthetic oil better? Yes. Uh, remember additives, we talked about additives, what, the things that make oil what oil is and the things that make oil do what they need to do to make your engine run for a long time and, and not like corrode itself and rust and sort of break down. Um, Anyone in the oil manufacturing world will tell you that synthetic oils cost twice as much because they spend twice as much on R&D, not into the oil, into the additives. So uh, no one's paying me to say this. Do the research. Synthetic oils prove better in every single case. Next myth. If I use synthetic oil, can I go back to conventional oil? Yes, the engine doesn't know, it doesn't care, it has no idea what you're doing. Um, if you stay with synthetic, it'll better protect your engine, you know, it's more expensive, but it will better protect it because it has better additives. But switching back and forth has no relevance to the engine whatsoever, it doesn't care, it's a rumor that nobody knows where it came from. Conventional oil will be fine the entire life of the engine, synthetic will make it a little bit more fine. And if you switch back and forth, it doesn't care, it doesn't matter. How often should I change my oil? Please never post this on the internet. Please, for the love of everything that is holy, don't post this on the internet. It's just endlessly argued about, and the short answer is, you should change your oil as often as the manufacturer recommends that you change your oil. If Volvo, for example, my engine says 250 engine hours, change your oil, do that. In fact, I do mine at 225 engine hours because fresh oil never hurt anything. It's like saying, I had a spinach smoothie yesterday, which is good for your body in every possible way. Should I have another one today? The answer is always yes. And if you don't, that's fine too. But it can't hurt to do better than you're supposed to do. So change your oil as often as you can afford to change your oil. How often should I change my oil filter? This is sort of interesting. I know some sailors that do it every other oil change. I know some that do it every third oil change. And I know some like me that do it every single oil change. And 
I have two reasons for doing it every single oil change. One is Volvo, who makes my engine, tells me to do it every oil change, so I listen. The other reason is my Volvo MD2030 uses an $8 oil filter, so really change it every time. I mean, why not? Next myth, small outboards run hotter, so they need different oil. This is so far from true. Small outboards tend to actually run cooler than car engines or diesels or anything inboard. And that's because they have a fresh supply of unlimited cool water that they suck up to cool themselves. And they're outside in the fresh air. And typically, if you're running it wide open, they have a good airflow around the engine. So on small outboards, I'm gonna say, use whatever the manufacturer says to use. And if you can cough up the extra cash, get the synthetic one. Next myth, can I mix brands of oil? Yes and no. Never mix viscosity. If it calls for 5W20, that's five weight in the winter, 20 weight when it's hot, never mix that, always use 5W20. But mixing brands is an interesting subject. Different brands have different additives and mixing them can cause you to have less of one additive and more of the other based on how the brands mix them. So can you do it in a pinch if you're low on oil and you're you know, trying to get home or get through the next week? Yes, absolutely. Don't make a practice of it. I mean, additives are the most important part and you don't wanna start messing with the scientific mixtures of the different brands of oil. You really don't. So in a pinch to get home, absolutely. This is a big one. Do I have to use the manufacturer's brand of oil even though that's what they told me? This is where we come into warranties and you really need to talk to the manufacturer and get this in writing. Uh, but what I found from speaking to a warranty expert, and I did go find one, and I did talk to him on the phone. Um, if mercury says you have to use mercury oil and you don't, according to the person I talked to, they don't legally have the right to void your warranty as long as you used a different brand of oil with the same ratings and the same quality as what they recommended you to use. Now, I'm not a lawyer. Don't take me to the bank on that. Um, if Mercury says use Mercury oil, you probably should do it. Um, otherwise, do your research, do your homework. Um, but what I'm hearing is as long as you use the same integrity of oil, you should be okay. My outboard calls for mineral oil-based lubricant instead of conventional oil. Can I use conventional oil? Um, no, and yes. Um, this is another mercury thing. And some mercuries call for mineral-based oil, but if you actually contact mercury and talk to them, most of the time they say, no, you can use this brand of synthetic or that brand of conventional, everything's fine. But if they don't and they say use mineral oil based oil, not petroleum based oil, you need to listen to them. Here's the last one and this one drives me kind of crazy. Should I goose the throttle on my engine before I shut it down? The answer is maybe, and you guys know what I mean. Um, when you're about to shut the engine down, you give it a whole shot of throttle and while it's revved all the way up, you kill it um, so that it revs back down and just stops kind of thing. And the answer is maybe. Some people swear by giving it a big old goose of throttle before they shut it down. And the reasons I've heard behind that are kind of endless. Uh, many people seem to think it gets a bunch of excess oil up into the, you know, the cam valleys or whatever kind of engine you have. Gets it up into the top end, end of the engine where the valves are and everything. Um, so on the next engine start, there'll be oil up there. Um, that's kind of dumb because oil runs downhill with gravity and there won't be oil up there in a week when you start your sailboat again. So seems silly. Um, from my experience, goosing the throttle on shutdown comes from the muscle car world and muscle car owners. And they do that from my understanding also having owned a few older cars. What you do that for is to fill the fuel bowl in the carburetor um, to make starting the car the next time easier, which sort of makes sense if you understand how carburetors work. You smash the throttle, it fills the fuel bowl, you cut the, the key, the fuel pump shuts off, the fuel bowl is full. So next time you go to start the car, it might be in a month, might be in a week, you hit the key and the fuel bowl is full. Um, kind of makes sense, but it has nothing to do with oil. Modern engines are very, very good at getting oil where it's needed as soon as the engine starts to spin. So in fact, they're designed with this in mind. 
goosing the throttle on, let's say, a turbo diesel, all that's actually doing is spooling up the turbo really, really fast and then cutting fuel, which is bad for the turbo. It doesn't cool the turbo. It just, it, it's all around bad. So before you goose the throttle and kill the ignition, maybe do a little bit of research into your engine and, and how it sort of works and figure that out for yourself. But it sounds like just an all around bad idea unless you have a 71 Hemi Cuda. So as a conclusion, I think you've noticed the theme here. Um, whatever the manufacturer says is what you should do. Don't go on internet forums asking what you should use for oil or how often you should change your oil. And any engine made within the last 40 years, there's really no greater expert than the person who made it, who designed it. Who knows what the tolerances are of the engine and what the needs are of the engine better than the person who actually designed it and actually built it. No one on the internet can answer your questions better than them. See y'all next week for another episode of Everything You Need to Know. If you want to see a certain subject, please drop it in the comments below. I love you guys. I'll see you on Friday.